Good evening. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kambiz Ranawardi, co-president of Columbia DC and a graduate of School of Engineering and Applied Science. We are honored to have uh, Volker Bergan, Settler Professor Emeritus of History at Columbia University, and Dr. Colleen Becker, Principal at Red Sand Ventures in London, to talk about capitalism's post-World War II uh, diverging paths in the US and Northern Europe. So please allow me to uh, very briefly introduce our incredible panel. Thank you so much, Kambiz, and it's a real honor to be invited to have this discussion with Volker, um, with such a fabulous audience. And um, thank you so much for the organization that you've done on our behalf. So Volker and I uh, have been having a conversation about the evolution of American capitalism in the post-war period for a few months now. And this was really inspired by us noticing that there's been a real sea change in the rhetoric of capitalism as it relates to American democracy in the post-war period. And we were especially interested in, in sort of uncovering the legacy and heritage of some new concepts that have been proposed in, uh, in the media and within uh, you know, business communities. And these are related to the ideas of purpose-driven business and uh, inclusive capitalism, which has also been called for by the Vatican. And finally, the idea of stakeholder capitalism, a capitalism that represents the interests of every uh, contributor um, within the value chain of a, of a corporation, all of, the, um, all of the workers, the suppliers, as well as the consumers, and then its impact on society at large. And we felt that this represented a, a big shift away from um, this sort of Milton Friedman style uh, maximizing shareholder profit and the idea that the social responsibility of a business is to increase its profits and nothing other than that. So this, this caused us to return to uh, the sort of post-war period, which really um, for us, was about the social policies and the public policies instantiated by the New Deal, which of course had started before the end of the Second World War um, and was really initiated during uh, the Roosevelt administration and then carried on through Truman and the Fair Deal um, and then um, was ushered into the post-war period by Eisenhower who of course was the supreme commander of the allied forces during the second world war. And we were really curious about the ways in which contemporary debates around, uh, sh around stakeholder capitalism seem to mirror or recall um, some new deal uh, public policy uh, program elements. So although the New Deal was um, Keynesian in its constitution, so um, deficit spending, um, it was also responding to uh, major crises that in the, in the 20th century, namely um, the Great Depression, which represents extreme poverty on the one hand, and then also the, the world wars, particularly the Second World War and the American experience of the Second World War and going to Europe and seeing the devastation wrought by these um, totalitarian regimes and um, communism, as we all know, then became a sort of flashpoint for American politics to um, rally against. So um, we were looking at the similarities between contemporary conversations around stakeholder capitalism, New Deal public policy programs, and their prolongation through the Eisenhower, and of course his vice president was Richard Nixon um, administration. And um, then comparing that to the history of Northern European capitalism and the different public policy programs that shaped this different type of capitalism. And uh, particularly with reference to Scandinavia, Germany, and um, then we were also thinking about the UK, so a sort of Anglo-American capitalism. So we're gonna talk about this for about 40 minutes and that will leave some time for Q&A. 
And I'm really delighted to hand it over to Folker, who will, you know, draw on some of the specifics. Well, thank you very much. And I would also like to welcome all of you. It's uh, wonderful that we have this modern technology. And I would actually like to thank uh, our uh, technical staff to have brought this about. It's really a wonderful way of conversing. Uh, I should say, however, that in the past year living in New York, I was also involved in Columbia Alumni uh, Association events. And I remember one very well, which uh, took us actually, because it was about immigration into this country, now again, an important topic, especially in New York. And I gave a lecture, an introductory lecture at the beginning, and then we actually went to Ellis Island, and it was a very congenial occasion, as you can imagine, and I wish we could all take uh, the boat now to Ellis Island and sit in the sun and have an open discussion. But unfortunately, that is not possible, and therefore uh, I think uh, I should start straight away because you will have noticed from Colleen's introduction that we are both historians and historians always feel it's important to look back not to the Middle Ages or to the beginning of history but to particular periods which we think were crucial to uh, the development and which also provides insights that's the important point I think we would like to make into our present situation. And that is why Colleen has just set out some of the contemporary issues that we are facing in this country, but also in Europe. But now we would like to take you back to at least 1945 and then move forward again and end up at the end of our 40 minutes, if we can keep our time uh, to uh, the present situation where I'm sure you will have many questions which we will then very be very happy to try to answer. So let me take you back and I think the key point that I would like to make about the early post-war period is that both uh, the US and Northern Europe had similarly managed economies. It was not the market exclusively that determine everything. And there was a, a major shift, of course, which started in the wake of the 29 depression and also the Second World War, as you just heard. So there is on the one hand, the New Deal in the United States, which is now actually being referred to again. And uh, that is why we thought it would be important to discuss this historical background. And then uh, we also thought we should talk about Northern Europe, deliberately Northern Europe rather than the whole of the EU, because in Southern Europe, I think you do have somewhat different circumstances. And if we want to talk about Scandinavian capitalism and also German capitalism, it will be easier to draw some parallels and experiences. But let me only give you a few tidbits about the Scandinavians because we can't spend too much time. Uh, as far as Finland is concerned, I would like to recommend this country uh, to you because by the World Happiness Report, which came out just a few weeks ago, actually, uh, this is one of the societies that is hap the happiest among the uh, 200 or so na nation states in the world. And of course, they do have universal health service um, and it's seen as a moral obligation, actually, to have a universal health service. Uh, I think they have also a very successful school system. Teachers are actually well regarded in Finland, and most of the nation is highly literate and highly educated and has made the transition into a high-tech economy, as some of you will know, Nokia, etc., very well. Now then, 
there is Denmark, and here I would merely like to mention an anecdote uh, that uh, my wife had, who is a publisher, uh, not too long ago in Copenhagen, when uh, she uh, was selling some books at an exhibition, um, she apologized to one of the buyers and said, I'm terribly sorry, I have to raise, pay, uh, raise some taxes for you. And this person then said, oh, we uh, don't mind paying taxes because we know that we are getting a good service for this. And I think there is therefore a for first important point, a very different attitude towards taxation from what you, I think, by and large, have in this country. So people are getting something in return. And um, here we are now talking about corporate taxes again. There the taxation system is much more progressive, as you know, than in this country, where the corporate tax is now down to 21%. And then I would like to mention Norway very briefly because they have also, uh, I think, invested their oil money very wisely to improve the educational system and the infrastructure as a whole uh, in the recent decades and use their oil money very wisely. But let me to turn to Sweden because that is usually mentioned as an important country uh, and I think they actually introduced pension systems, uh, systems age old uh, pensions, for example, before the First World War. But then the First World War was, of course, also in Sweden, a major uh, shift for the expansion of, uh, I would not want to call it the welfare state, because that in this country is always associated with welfare queens, etc. But I would like to call it the social state, the socially responsible state, which is, as Doreen has, uh, Colleen has mentioned, uh, responsible not just for the wel wealthy few, but for, for many others. And then um, I think in the 1930s, um, Sweden already became a social democratic, not a socialist country. They were all reformists. They wanted to gradually change uh, the economies uh, and to modernize the economies, even at that stage. And I think uh, then after the Second World War, there was um, actually um, one uh, famous um, a famous prime minister who was in power from 1946 to 1969. His name was Tage Erlander, uh, Erlander and he actually also worked very hard to expand the social state. Now, very similar developments took place in Germany after 1945 and you had to have a social state in Germany partly because you had millions of refugees, millions of expellees, millions of bombed out people, war widows, orphans and therefore uh, the Germans introduced the social market economy and that is again a very important term I think because it points to the obligation that uh, society as a whole felt not towards just the wealthier classes, but also towards those at the bottom of the pile. So here you get the social state. And then I want to mention one further development in Germany that was actually introduced by the British occupation authorities, and that is co-determination. And here I want to start uh, with a sort of experience I had many years ago when I was a participant in a panel here, which was organized by a big Swiss insurance company that brought their American employees together with their European employees. And the Europeans explained to them, well, we have co-determination. We actually have a trade unionists sitting not just on our um, management boards, but also on our, um, on our supervisory boards. And 
it was almost impossible to explain to the American managers of this insurance company that this was a good idea because they were used to them and us and bargaining, of course, but usually confrontationist and conflictual. conflictual. So I hope you can see that there is also a social state in Germany, but it's important to emphasize that it was paralleled by what happened in the 1950s after the Second World War in this country. It's often forgotten that this was a Keynesian managed economy also. And I think, oh, Colleen, maybe you would like to come in at this point to talk a little bit more about the 1950s and 60s and Lyndon Johnson, etc., because it's often forgotten today what happened in the United States in the 50s. Certainly. Thank you so much for that perspective, Volker, and for all of those great anecdotes about the Northern European context. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, just to sort of get back to the New Deal and, um, you know, sort of following on the New Deal then, which was really more of um, a social insurance policy on the one hand. Um, yes, there was Keynesian deficit spending, but there were also, um, you know, a, a lot of um, sort of public works programs. So environmental programs, conservation programs, infrastructure programs, and these all created jobs for ordinary workers who either had been out of work during the Great Depression or um, indeed, you know, are returning from, from war. Um, and of course, the American economy was burgeoning um, at this point, whereas in Europe, they were really putting the pieces back together after radical devastation. Um, and so what becomes very interesting is the way that these public policy programs are implemented becomes a, a bone of contention. And as much as, um, as Eisenhower prolonged this um, New Deal, which you know, was a democratic initiative, he also, in, despite the fact that under his um, tenure, the US economy grew so rapidly, he also sowed the seeds of dissent with his, within his own Republican party because he really represented a vision that became um, uh, replaced later on um, after the Johnson administration. So moving on to the Johnson administration, you have a sort of um, soft power um, movement towards creating jobs through these various public works and public projects and policy programs. And then the Johnson administration, he takes it one step further. So whereas um, Eisenhower and Nixon ushered the Civil Rights Act through Congress in 1957, Johnson starts legislating in the 60s after JFK's assassination um, and he becomes president. He takes it one step further and he introduces over 200 different pieces of legislation which support his great, pol his, um, his great society public policy program. And this really provokes the ire of, um, of Republicans especially. And at the same time, he was trying to level the playing field um, through the introduction of uh, civil rights acts and um, legislation which would create um, equality of opportunity, um, equality of, um, you know, possibility for creating wealth, um, and also, you know, um, really forcing through um, initiatives that would enable every member of the American democracy to participate in capitalism. Um, he was really forcing people in the South and he was a Southern president to behave in ways that were totally against their tradition, totally against their culture and completely um, antithetical to their sensibilities. So um, this isn't, I'm not sort of suggesting that there's a causal relationship between the legislative nature of the great society and um, a corresponding backlash. But in fact, uh, a backlash did emerge from that period. And this is represented, um, I think, most uh, substantially and significantly through the figures of Barry Goldwater, 
um, who had lost by a landslide to, um, to LBJ, but then also um, Milton Friedman, whom in 1970, after the um, Civil Rights Acts had been passed, after uh, Martin Luther King had been assassinate, assassinated, after all of the riots um, and protests associated with the Vietnam War, and also um, after uh, the, uh, the Democratic National Committee um, had been um, violently suppressed in Chicago, and Chicago was decimated, the South Side of Chicago was decimated and ghettoized and really has never been rebuilt. Um, Milton Friedman from the ivory tower of the South Side of Chicago, the University of Chicago, then publishes his Friedman Doctrine at the end of the Great Society um, in 1970 and really sort of um, ushers in this new phase of, um, of uh, of neoliberalism, of um, you know, freeing up the markets, um, of deregulation, and this sort of represents a new era, um, one that sort of bookends the Eisenhower, um, Nixon administrations, but then also um, puts a cap on LBJ's Great Society programs. Okay, well, very good. The only thing I wanted to mention because it's being discussed today. Eisenhower was responsible for creating the US highway system, which was a public work system. And you know, now we are discussing, interestingly enough, how to improve it again because bridges are collapsing, etc. So major public investments are actually also necessary at that point. But let me shift, if I may, now to Britain, because while well, uh, you, Colleen, have just talked about the 1970s and the shifts in this country um, and ultimately leading to Carter and Reaganism and neoliberalism. I think uh, what is also important is the British experience in those days, because the Brits are in trouble, partly because they had banked on their colonial and commonwealth empire to survive after the Second World War. That is how they thought they could fund their national health service, which they also introduced, but also, of course, uh, all sorts of other social programs. Um, and then, of course, uh, partly because of Vietnam and uh, American problems, the Brits also hit the rocks in the 1970s, which was exacerbated by the oil price crisis at the same time. And you may remember, or some of you may remember that there were strike movements um, under Prime Minister Heath, followed by Prime Minister Wilson, who was a Labour Prime Minister, and Callaghan, also Labour still, not being able to handle the strike movements, the miners, and as a result of this, you now have the backlash that uh, Colleen just mentioned with regard to America, uh, and you have the rise of Margaret Thatcher. And Margaret Thatcher really leads the way into this Friedmanite neoliberal world of the 1980s. Reagan is rather slow in this respect, partly because the United States is a federal state and you have to look at what is happening in the South or in the North or West, whereas Britain is a highly centralized political system. So if you as prime minister have the majority in parliament, you can do virtually anything. You can't simply pass legislation. And this is what, uh, what uh, um, Mrs. Thatcher now did. Uh, she first of all clobbered the, uh, the unions and virtually destroyed them. But then also she began to cut public expenditure, saying that the social state is far too expensive and uh, therefore we have to cut back. Uh, there is also uh, the cutting at the same time, and that's very important, of taxes, but they are tilted towards helping the wealthier groups in British society rather than the so-called masses. And then 
you also have the beginnings of a deindustrialization process which had begun earlier in in Britain but uh, she now shifts the balance between industry which was based primarily in the English North um, Sheffield, Nottingham and Manchester and shifts it towards the city of London. You get the financialization, so-called, of the British economy. And as a result of this, of course, also uh, the uh, Big Bang that is initiated in the city of London to make it the hub, the major hub in the uh, world uh, financial system. And you may have come across Arthur Latta, who is an American economist at Chicago, who at the time invented the trickle-down theory, because he said all this investment, um, encouragement of the market and investors uh, will ultimately benefit also the rest of the population, because the boat will be uplifted by the willingness of the investors to invest in the economy. Reagan follows suits, and I think we are now in the 1990s, Colleen, and maybe you should come in now to look at what happens under not H.W. Bush, he is in power of too short and he has his hands full with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the handling of the German question uh, of the 1990 to 1991 and two, but there is also Clinton, of course, and he is a very interesting president also because of the people he surrounds him with. So would you like to explain uh, sure. a little bit I mean, what we have discussed uh, with regard to the 1990s? Of course, um, I'm very conscious of time and I'm noticing that we only have about uh, a little bit, maybe 15 or so minutes left. But I would like to dial the clock back just a tiny bit. I would like to return to, um, you know, the Friedman moment, the 1970s, Richard Nixon. And what's really interesting about him, of course, is that he isn't a neoconservative and he's not a neoliberal, um, which is why Reagan's rise to power is, um, is so fascinating because um, it does point to the split within the Republican Party about which direction um, one should take. But the other thing that we can say about Nixon, which I think is significant for American capitalism, is this concept of detente with the Soviet Union on the one hand, and then this idea of opening relations with China, which, you know, and you can see to this day that some of the um, diplomatic work that he did, which was so impactful, um, also presented um, a bone of contention for the Republican Party. And, and obviously, even to this day, we have um, rhetoric about China, which is still very contentious and which is you know, still very unresolved. So some of these diplomatic issues, which point to the tenor and development and evolution of uh, capitalism in the United States after the Nixon administration, um, were shaped, obviously, during his administration. But then, um, so we can talk about the shift from, um, you know, the Eisenhower slash uh, Nixon type or style of um, treating through public policy um, capitalism in the United States to, the, uh, to Ronald Reagan, to, uh, you know, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, and then also, you know, uh, the trickle down economics. Um, so Laffer, of course, was also a member of Donald Trump's administration and served on his um, economic recovery board. So, you know, these ideas, which were initiated through the publication of this Friedman Doctrine in 1970, really were impactful. And of course, Ronald Reagan had hitched his cart to Barry Goldwater's horse. And so a lot of the political rhetoric that we see and a lot of the politic, the um, political, uh, sorry, the, um, the public programs, um, which the Republicans carried through the 80s, 90s, and even to this day, were sort of um, conceptualized 
through the neoconservatism of the Goldwater era. And um, what I find really fascinating is how they reach their sort of apex um, in today's um, highly deregula deregulated environment in the United States um, and to sort of trace how that deregulation happened. So it happened with union busting in the, in the UK um, context as well as in the United States. So I thought, I've always found it very interesting that one of the first things that Ronald Reagan did as president was um, bust PATCO, which was the only union which that had contributed to his um, campaign. So he busted the uh, air traffic controllers union as kind of an example, and um, then proceeded to, um, to realize um, a lot of the uh, public policy and um, intentions. So we have uh, a reduction of taxes, of the tax rate uh, in the upper bracket from I believe 70% to 50%, but also for the, for the lowest income bracket. And so I think it went from like 14 or 17% to 11%. So that was one aspect, and that sort of formed one type of um, economic um, intervention, which, um, and the idea behind this, um, this uh, sort of tax um, truncation um, was that um, by creating more um, available capital, that, um, that sort of the, the wealth savings um, through these tax breaks would sort of trickle down to the rest of society or, you know, that these tax breaks would be reinvested in, um, in the economy and, um, and that that would stimulate the economy somehow. So that was one idea. Another idea was, of course, deregulation, which then sort of escalated and snowballed throughout the 80s and 90s. So we see the, um, the deregulation of the financial industry, the deregulation of the energy industry, which becomes significant um, during the second Bush administration. Um, and then of course the deregulation, de-standardization of the labor market, which I think really reaches its full, um, full force in um, today's platform capitalism and the gig economy, which is um, you know, largely unregulated. I think Uber workers were just recently described as workers. Um, you know, and the idea that everybody can represent themselves within a, within a labor market. Um, and of course, what we had seen during the Johnson administration was the institutionalization of rights um, that could be defended and also existed within law. And, you know, from Reagan onwards, then we see how these rights were sort of chipped away um, and became more or less, um, you know, a, a very intentional way of freeing up markets um, and, free, and freeing markets up from government and from this very heavy handed way of um, ensuring that, um, that that public vision would be realized through law. Well, uh, okay, but Colleen, I would like to get us back to the uh, 1990s, if I may, because the Clinton years are very important. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, this country was clearly number one in the world. And I think it behaved as number one because it became unilateralist. I think the great mistake that was made in those years was not to integrate the, the losers, if you like, in the Cold War race uh, into the world economy and world politics. And I think uh, we are now facing still the resentments that this created in um, not just in Russia, but also in other parts of the world. Uh, but Clinton is also interesting because it was a boom period. Uh, if you look at the uh, Dow Jones index in those years, it was going through the roof. Uh, it was a casino capitalism as it was called. And in fact, Alan Greenspan, uh, 
who was the uh, chair of the Fed, uh, got so worried in 1996 uh, about this boom that he made a speech in which he warned against the irrational exuberance, the irrational exuberance of um, the stock market. Uh, but he could have done something about this by raising, for example, interest rates, but he didn't dare this because he was so afraid that this would lead to a panic and therefore the casino, the carousel would grind to a halt. And I think this is a fascinating period because he surrounded himself with Robert Rubin and with Larry Summers and, you know, all these people, Chicago economists who are now again in the limelight, actually, and warning us about what might happen in the future. So the 1990s are very interesting. And the last point then is the Glass-Steagall Act. Uh, Roosevelt had introduced in 1933 the Glass-Steagall Act, which put up a firewall between the global investment uh, firms and the traditional banking system in this country. And it was torn down in 1999. And as a result of this, the entire banking system of the United States, all these little savings accounts, etc., were open to the global economy and the financialization of the global economy. And I think that was also a very dangerous step, which partly triggered already in 2001, the tech bubble that burst, but then of course led in 1907, uh, 2007, finally uh, to the bursting of the really big bubble. And it was, I think Bernanke, then he should be given credit. He had studied the 1929 depression and knew exactly how he uh, rescued the banking system, of course, at that point, by pumping a lot of uh, credit uh, in, in, and retained the liquidity of the, of the entire uh, money system in this country. So, the 1990s, uh, and the interesting thing is there were always people who warned against this. Uh, I remember Helmut Schmidt, the former chancellor, saying, we must re-civilize capitalism. It's getting out of hand. And of course, no one listened because everyone was optimistic. The stock market was still going up and up until 2007. And now we are still with the living with the consequences. So I wonder whether you would like to look at uh, how 2008 actually affected us to this day. And then perhaps we can begin to think about, about uh, some concluding remarks and the question and answer period, which we want to get onto. So please, uh, if you have something that you would like to uh, in, uh, include at this point. Sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, what I find very interesting about the, um, the global financial crisis, I mean, there are many, many things that are interesting about the global financial crisis, but it was, um, it was sort of, uh, and there was an antecedent in the Enron crisis, which um, had we sort of had the, um, I guess, bandwidth to, um, to register the Enron crisis in a, in a very analytical way, um, we might have sort of caught some of the warning signs, um, which also were underlying factors in the global financial crisis. So just to refresh everybody's memory, um, so there was the tech, the tech bubble had burst. And then of course, um, there was 9-11 and the war on terror which is really the dominant theme of, of George W. Bush's um, administration. Sure, he had um, you know, public policy programs like compassionate conservatism, which of course um, also had been a feature of his father's administration. Um, but these were really voluntary um, type initiatives. And, um, but you know, the war on terror was really a feature of his administration. And then the Enron crisis happened all in 2001. 
And, um, you know, and it featured some of the same things that would actually explode in 2007, 2008, which is basically that, you know, deregulation enabled, um, you know, a lack of transparency, a lack of um, purview, a lack of oversight. And then um, the energy market had been deregulated to the point where um, Enron had realized that it was more lucrative to trade in uh, energy as a commodity, um, to trade energy contracts than it was to actually produce energy. And so again, it started um, you know, trading in dodgy contracts, um, which uh, did not have um, proper due diligence and um, you know, exploded in the bankruptcy and scandal um, of this company. And this basically is just uh, like the, the tip of the iceberg, which then became increasingly apparent um, you know, during the global financial crisis. So one thing that I would like to say um, about the 90s as well is, um, which I think feeds into Folker, the resentment that you had mentioned earlier, is, um, you know, aside from the neoliberalism, um, we also had, you know, globalization, which really took off at that time. And I think what's really interesting about these uh, platform technologies that, um, that facilitate a decentralized labor market today is they are global, right? And um, so in many ways, you know, all of the things that we're talking about from a contemporary perspective have been in place for decades. And it's really a sort of a snowballing effect um, that we can see over time where, you know, one shift in political rhetoric or one policy move means something pretty significant down the line. So um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if that has been sufficient um, conversation yeah. around the global I, I, would I think you have more to say about it. Yes, uh, you know, since uh, we only have a few minutes now, I think we should go back to Europe and look at the transatlantic relationship and its problems, uh, which you know have been severe actually over the past four years. But the important point is about the themes that we have pursued about the social uh, social state not the welfare state, but the social state, universal health insurance. This was, of course, all accepted in Northern Europe. And uh, now, of course, uh, as a result of these pressures that I think the United States exerted, especially in the 1990s, when the United States was number one, there was always a spillover effect of neoliberalism also into Europe. We should recognize this. There were also people who said, well, this American model, this is what we should go for. But there was always this reluctance at the same time. And we say, uh, the, the Europeans said, we don't want to dismantle our social state as much as it has happened in the United States and also in Britain. And we don't want to deindustrialize as far, and we don't uh, want to uh, cut uh, public expenditure, uh, even on the cultural front. You know, to this day, uh, I think the Northern Europeans spend quite a lot of public money still uh, on, uh, on, on cultural things, um, and not just uh, on, uh, on politics and in the economy. So I think it's very interesting how you get different cultural attitudes also, which have persisted and which I think, uh, of course, were exacerbated by Trump, but now the precarious uh, balance has to be found again between the two sides uh, of the Atlantic. And I think Biden is, it seems to me, uh, trying quite hard, partly because the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, knows Europe very well. He grew up in Paris, and as a result of it, I think he has a better understanding of this peculiar attitude of the Europeans to go hook, line, and sinker for this neoliberal uh, model. 
and I think that is why the present is so interesting because it will be uh, fascinating to see how it actually will balance itself out and how, of course, Biden with his massive, massive public investments uh, and the New Deal, the Green New Deal, whatever the terms that are being used now uh, will yield is at the same time it leads to a lot of sympathy. The problem that we should keep away from perhaps, however, is how the pandemic has skewed all these uh, attempts, of course, because, uh, well, in some ways it has probably accelerated the transatlantic cooperation again, but it has also created difficulties. So maybe at this point, it's already, we've been talking for about 40, 45 minutes, we should stop and see whether our monitor will uh, have some questions that he wants to pitch to us from the audience. Sure. I see quite a few questions actually. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's see. Um, let's see, here's one. Um, is there any evidence to suggest that the Thatcher administration was influenced by thinkers like Milton Friedman from the US or were her policies a result of her own thinking? Well, let me try to start this. You know, I think the important thing is that um, politicians do not operate in a cocoon, in a sort of isolation cell. Uh, and I think it's therefore always very difficult to uh, to decide definitively where politicians like Thatcher and she was you know a key person partly because she had the majority in parliament she could push through these changes that she introduced in the 80s where she got these ideas from some people say well it was this uh, young uh, woman from Grantham in uh, Lincolnshire who uh, rose into politics from lower middle class background. And uh, she picked up all sorts of ideas in Oxford where she went to college. And then of course, these ideas began to circulate. Friedman was a fascinating figure in those days. He had been sitting in the doghouse in 1945 because that's when the Keynesians had their field day. And after 1980 then, uh, it was all of a sudden the shift and everyone, given the stagflation and the crisis of the 1970s, was looking to the alternative solution that Friedman had suggested in Chicago from 1945 onwards. And that's the fascinating theoretical debate, of course, that goes on. But she was a practical politician and uh, she thought she had some recipes that she wanted to apply. This is a very interesting question. I'm going to take this one, Volker, and then I think maybe you can have the next one. Um, but this question is, as a Southerner, why wasn't Johnson more aware of the pushback he was going to get, sorry, from the Southern population? Why did he think his civil rights legislation wasn't going to get a backlash that would cause problems later? That's a great question. Actually, he did anticipate it. He said when he was signing the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which by the way, um, many very well-known uh, politicians didn't sign, didn't support. He said, we've lost the South for a generation. Actually, it's more than a generation. Um, but he did anticipate that. What's really interesting is um, his great nemesis, Barry Goldwater, didn't think that civil rights should be legislated. He thought that civil rights were a matter of the heart. So it's up to you to decide whether or not you think your civil liberties should be um, defended in law, or do you think your civil liberties are simply a, a matter of the heart and potentially could just be sort of voluntary um, 
uh, attended to on a voluntary basis, um, which I think is a separate debate. But he very he was very conscious of what he was doing. But he felt very strongly that um, that you know this legislation was the only way that civil rights could potentially be enacted um, within American democracy. But I think that's a separate debate. But I love this history. I think it's really fascinating. But um, Folker, this one is for you. I think. So how do we get to social democracy in the United States? Huh. Well, that's a very good question. I think, um, you know, I think first of all, we should, uh, and, and the big mistake uh, that Saunders made in the campaign that social democracy, Swedish European style, and also, if you like, uh, Rooseveltian style, uh, was not socialism. By introducing that word, you know, that scared everybody because that immediately raised the question of the comparison with socialism in the former Soviet Union, etc., etc. So, social democracy is basically uh, a, an attempt to create a stakeholder society in which everybody participates uh, and not just the wealthy groups and you know the market is not the only determining factor in an economy there should be other voices that should be heard including of course trade unions and you still have trade unions it's interesting that this is now starting in this country again and that uh, even Jeff Bezos has some problems with some, uh, uh, you know, fulfillment centers in the South where people try to organize. But there is this basic hostility. And uh, what I should like to mention actually is this Anglo-Saxon tradition that labor relations is them and us. And that is different, of course, in Europe especially in Northern Europe, co-determination. You participate, you have a worker director on your management board who is, a, a, you know, a trade unionist often, highly trained. They knew how to, uh, you know, interact with the other managers, the, with the financial, chief financial officer, etc., of a corporation. And as a result of this, I think you have a much more partner um, uh, relationship. And in Britain, the irony is to my mind is that the British actually as an occupation power introduced co-determination in uh, the Rhineland in their zone of occupation in 1946-47. And then they saw the results and you know, labor relations were quite peaceful in Germany during the boom years, certainly, because it was possible to make compromises and allow everyone a share in the gains in the economy. And then in the 1970s, when there was all this trade union trouble, etc., and blackouts, uh, a royal commission was established in England, led by a historian, Lord Bullock, you may remember that name. And uh, he suggested that a co-determination model should also be introduced in Britain. And what happened? The employer said, no, thank you very much. And the trade unionists also said, no, thank you very much. While they were still in existence in a few years time, uh, you know, it, uh, they had disappeared. So I think there are many ironies also when you look at labor relations and I think uh, that they have to be reformed in, to put it again, this ugly word, in a social democratic way, which means also that there must be a democratic element. Uh, there must be a consensus. It can't be totally polarized, them and us, or in terms of party politics, Republicans versus Democrats. And I think Biden is trying very hard. You know, he just said, I can perhaps compromise with my uh, investment uh, in the infrastructure that he wants to launch, uh, his trillions, two trillions. Uh, and I think there will be a compromise 
maybe Mitch McConnell will come along eventually and said, well, we like some of the things that you are doing after all. So there is a modernizing push in this society now, which I find fascinating, which reminds me a little bit of what happened in the 1930s and 1950s also, when this, uh, uh, when this society was much more highly mobilized, not in a sort of retroactive way, uh, we don't want this, but rather in a forward-looking, progressive way. So um, thank you for that, Volker. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next question, which is why did the Friedman Doctrine carry so much weight? Um, and I think that's a great question. I'm just gonna answer this very quickly. And I would say, I don't, you know, I'm sure that there are a lot of different explanations, but my explanation would be that he was part of a movement, which is actually called movement conservatism. So um, it wasn't just Friedman. He, you know, he sort of, um, he did a, a bold, he, he, he did a very bold thing when he published his doctrine in the New York Times um, and, you know, and made, uh, these ideas very visible and gave them um, a very public forum. Uh, but there were a lot of different um, contributors to this movement conservatism. Um, so it wasn't just Friedman, it was also, you know, quite famous, um, you know, Chicago economists like Leo Strauss. Um, you know, we've already mentioned Arthur Laffer, who, um, you know, would sit around a table with people like Ronald Reagan and Dick Cheney. Um, so it's not like these people were existing in isolation and publishing academic papers and that these were being received by academic audiences. I mean, um, you know, this is very much um, a sort of marriage of minds. Um, so there was already a political trend that was moving towards um, neoconservatism, neoliberalism, and that then was tied to economic models, um, which seemed to make yeah. sense um, at the time to um, address problems. I, yes, I would entirely agree with you, but I also think that there are times when you are, as I put, uh, put it, you are in the doghouse because the spirit of the age is against you, as I said. You know, he wrote in the late 40s and was already very angry that he, his voice wasn't heard. But then you have the 1970s stagflation, uh, the oil price crisis, uh, the Vietnam War, inflationary uh, costs uh, of this war in, in South Asia. And as a result of this, you have a change. And this is the hour then of uh, the Friedmanites who come along and ultimately sweep the board because, as I mentioned, Alan Greenspan, you know, bought into this and Robert Rubin and Larry Summers. And, you know, think of Jeffrey Sachs, um, who went to the Soviet Union to said, we need uh, in the Soviet Union shock and awe after the collapse of communism there and we need a neoliberal economy. Well, it failed, of course, completely. And I, since he's a colleague at Columbia, uh, always feel that uh, he changed his mind. It's very much to his credit because he is now concerned actually with problems that we've been talking about of a social capitalism, which he sees in global terms, of course, and not just in transatlantic terms. So if you look at his intellectual development here at the Earth Institute at Columbia and later on and uh, all the books he's been writing, you see this shift again. And people fortunately can experience a uh, Damascus experience, if you like, and change their mind about something. So uh, nevertheless, the 1990s, Clinton bought into all this, partly because it was so successful at the time until it crashed, because casino capitalism is not always going up and up, but capitalism also has the tendency to go down. And then it is called a sort of adjustment uh, of the boom 
uh, that uh, we've been seeing. So I'm a little worried about uh, uh, Diamond now saying, oh, there will be a huge boom after the uh, COVID crisis is overcome. Uh, well, let's wait and see and let's be more careful and deliberate and above all rational in our um, handling of economic problems that are not just national American, but are global. Um, I'm going to skip to um, a question, which is given the decline of unions, at least in terms of percentage of workers in them, is stakeholder capitalism anything <clears throat> more than a slogan, excuse me. Um, well, I think, um, and Folker, I hope you answer this one as well, because you know quite a lot about um, the history of unions. Um, well, I think that stakeholder capitalism uh, does address problems um, within, the, uh, within a decentralized and deregulated uh, labor market on the one hand, but stakeholder capitalism isn't devoted exclusively to workers' rights. So um, it, it also considers the social impact of the sort of community impact, um, but it also um, takes into consideration suppliers, um, customers, uh, as well as workers. So I would say um, there's that aspect, which is that it's a little bit broader than a, a union, which is sort of exclusive to um, mm. the defense um, an assertion yeah. of workers' rights, um, members' rights. Um, but aside from that, you know, what I think is really fascinating about all of these calls for, um, you know, an inclusive capitalism that would address wealth and economy uh, in inequalities or a stakeholder capitalism that um, recognizes the social responsibility and social impact of corporations um, is that this is basically sort of voluntary self-regulation of um, businesses which have signed up to these mandates. So um, the Business Roundtable had um, issued a statement on the purpose of a corporation in 2019, um, in which it, uh, it asserted this vision of stakeholder capitalism, which also has been um, uh, articulated through organizations like the World Economic Forum. In fact, um, you know, uh, the the head of the World Economic Forum has actually written a book about it. Um, so uh, I guess the short answer is I, I wonder myself, um, but let's hope that, um, that, these, that these aspirations solidify into um, real action, perhaps not in a, such a heavy handed Johnsonian way, but maybe, and I do believe that the Biden administration is very sensitive to these issues, and we already see, as Volker has said, um, him referring to the New Deal. And also he's been um, considering the idea of formulating a civilian conservation corps to um, address um, these issues, you know, environmental and climate change issues, which are pressing. Um, but this is a, this is a complete um, referencing of the New Deal civilian conservation corps. Um, so let's see, you know, let's see what happens during the Biden administration. But I think the signs are, are positive. Volker, what do you think? Yeah, well, to come back to the union question, of course, also in Europe, you have had a decline in union membership, but they have not disappeared completely. And there are still some pretty powerful, not in Britain so much, but uh, pretty powerful unions uh, in Northern Europe. And uh, as a result of this, I think the important point here is that you have to create institutions because if you have institutions, you create frameworks within which both sides of industry in this case would have to operate. Um, and co-determination is institutionalized. And as a result of this, I think it forms also behavior and that is why you get so much discussion certainly in Europe right now what we need is a rule-based capitalism not one that is totally unregulated and you know can do whatever uh, the 
top decision makers and the company heads decide, but you have to have rules by which uh, you abide and uh, that you, uh, you, you shift uh, or, or abide by in terms of your policy making. And that is, I think, something that is still stronger in uh, Europe than it is in this country. Although, as I said earlier, you now have the stirrings at least of uh, unions who want to participate and they want to participate in a, an inst institutional framework. You want to have rules under which you regulate your labor relations rather than leaving everything to one side to decide the shareholder capitalism freedmen you know the only just imagine the only social responsibility that um, you know managers have is to make profits well that's a slogan which i hope we are going to say farewell to because that is led to the rebellion, if I may just bring this in, because it has created downward mobility of large social groups in this country. And they have one power means, namely the ballot box, and they rebelled at the ballot box. And Trumpism is indeed also a rebellion against not just the swamp in Washington and corruption, but also against um, the way uh, neoliberalism ran the economy. And uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm of course glad that Trump is no longer calling the shots and that we have a different president who has a different approach to all this, including, I hope, also labor relations. I think this next question is sort of a continuation of what you've just been discussing, Volker. Um, the left versus right dichotomy as a view of history, not my specialty, is nuanced by social movements. It seems to me that the current battle between white supremacy, BLM, Black Lives Matter, neoliberalism, unions, and faith-based charities is much more complex than left-right politics please comment. I would agree. And I hope that we've um, sort of muddied the waters a bit in showing how um, at certain moments in time, uh, Republican uh, presidents have carried on um, policies which were initiated by Democratic presidents and vice versa. And um, Folker and I also separately have talked about the, um, about resentment and um, resentment as a historical actor, um, which I think is interesting um, how emotions can play into, can become uh, sort of geopolitically relevant. And um, we see this, you know, at the ballot box with, for example, things like Brexit. Um, but also, Folker, I wonder um, if maybe this might be a good time for you to discuss um, the uh, German uh, Catholic um, uh, ideas that we had been talking about and yeah. maybe um, rope in yeah. some of the um, conversations we've been having about the political import of faith. Yes. Well, I, I'm glad you raised this because it's been a very important factor, not so much in Sweden uh, and you know in northern in the Scandinavian countries because they are Protestant. Uh, although I think many of them also feel a Christian obligation towards their neighbor. Uh, after all, uh, Protestantism is also motivated by that. But I think what is often overlooked is the influence of social Catholicism. And that goes back actually again to the Great Depression because there is a famous encyclical uh, of uh, the Pope in 1931, uh, which tries to take account of the fact that the church cannot leave the workers who are unemployed en masse, uh, and especially Catholic workers alone to, you know, with their 
to their fate in of unemployment in the 1930s. And therefore you get this social Catholic tradition, which re-emerges after the Second World War. It has been suppressed, of course, by the Nazis and uh, is a very important factor, especially in the Catholic Rhineland, but also in Bavaria, which are major Catholic strongholds in the Federal Republic to this day. And therefore you have an alliance actually between these uh, left-wing social democrats uh, who come from a social democratic tradition that goes back to the 19th century and who are uh, usually Protestants and believing Protestants. Uh, Helmut Schmidt, you know, went to church and says, I need ethical standards for my political behavior. I can't stand this corruption and total immorality around me. We've got to have these standards. And that is taken up by cardinals actually in the 1950s and 60s. And the social obligation is revived and is an important factor also in, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in co-determination because there is one, and the Jesuits are always very interesting intellectuals in this respect. There is one a famous uh, Catholic theologian, uh, Professor uh, Oswald von Nell Bräuning. And he said, we cannot just hammer it out between labor and, uh, and capitalism. We have to bend capitalism a little bit in the direction of labor so that there is a meeting of minds in the middle. So uh, he was talking about vegan uh, uh, to bend capitalism. And I think that is what we have to do again because shareholder capitalism is not concerned with the rest of society as Friedman said so, so expressly. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, religious faith has been politicized in the United States in a completely different way. And, you know, religious charities can indeed operate as lobbyists. Um, but, uh, you know, there has been a whole history. And I think that this is an, another really interesting historical comparison is the history of um, the politicization of religious faith in the post-war period in the United States. So you have uh, Ronald Reagan, for example, giving his weekly broadcasts and mentioning faith and mentioning the family. And part and parcel of this neoconservative movement was the idea that we should reintroduce prayer into, um, into schools. Um, and so there, and there becomes a politicization of, um, of personal uh, wealth um, that, is, that has a moral component. I think it's called prosper the prosperity gospel. And it's about being deserving. Um, and if you, you know, if you are deserving, then you will achieve the wealth that, um, that you deserve. And, and this is really, um, you know, it's politicized on the one hand, but it's also, you know, uh, sort of uh, framed in very moralizing terms. Um, so, and then you have, of course, the moral majority, and you have this idea of compassionate conservatism, which also has uh, religious undertones. Um, so there are different ways, I think, in which faith can be politicized and also included in capitalist rhetoric. Um, and, um, you know, there are, and I think that what Folker has made very clear is that the social responsibility aspect of, um, of Catholicism and also Protestantism in Northern Europe, especially Germany, um, has a very different sort of capitalist um, structure surrounding it. Um, and so there are very different um, sort of social policy outcomes. Uh, I, I don't know if that clarified things or if it made it more complicated, but um, let's move on to the next question. Uh, this one is for Folker. With an eye to the future, do you think there might be greater transatlantic alignment on economic policies to act as a bulwark, bulwark against the Asian bloc? Very good question. One uh, sentence about, you know, the previous question, I think uh, 
uh, also, uh, we have been concerned very much with a rational analysis of socioeconomic questions. And the question of religion, et cetera, brings in, of course, transcendental values and morality, which has also a sort of economic significance, but the way it has developed in this country is also that it became very much emotional, uh, well, identity politics. And that, of course, uh, is not what we wanted to get into. But now to your question, could you repeat it again, perhaps? Uh, with an eye to the future, do you think there might be greater transatlantic alignment on economic policies to act as a bulwark against the Asian bloc? I think so. Uh, and however, I think we should realize one thing compared with the 1990s. In the 1990s, this country was clearly number one in the world economy and therefore also in world politics and military matters. Um, the Soviet Union had been defeated and China had not uh, achieved the kind of breakthrough that we have seen in recent decades. And I think we are now again in a multipolar society, a world society. We are no longer in a unipolar world where one great power calls the shots. And I think this country will have to adjust to this change uh, in the balances of powers. And, you know, I'm therefore glad to see that uh, there, there, are, there is confrontation, of course, with uh, the Soviet Union, uh, with Russia, and also with China. But there is also feelers that are being put out. And I think particularly interesting is now what is happening with re regard to I I Iran. So I uh, would like to wait and see how this plays out. But in this respect, the Europeans are, of course, entirely on the American side. Uh, I think they want to preserve the transatlantic relationship that Trump, of course, disrupted very badly. I'm on the board of the Aspen Institute in Berlin, which some of you will know the Aspen system, and they are terribly worried about the transatlantic relationship during the Trump years and said we must do everything to foster it again and to help um, the, uh, the old alliance, but it's not an exclusive alliance that ultimately dominates everything. We've got to get used to a multipolar world again, as we had in the 19th century, after all. <clears throat> So I think we have time for maybe two or three questions. Um, so here is a very interesting one. The pandemic has been incredibly destructive, but it also may create opportunities. Are you seeing any specific opportunities for a return to a more humanistic capitalism with more progressive taxes, more infrastructure spending, for example, and how does it differ in the United States versus Europe? Um, I think we probably both want to answer this question, but I'm going to go first because <laughs> I want to, I, there was something that I wanted to mention, which I haven't been able to mention yet. And this is the, um, the Brad Smith presentation um, that I had attended last week. So Brad Smith is the president of Microsoft. And he had been talking, and Microsoft is one of the signatories. The, 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 you know, Microsoft is one of the companies that backs um, this principle of stakeholder capitalism. And um, he said two things which I found very interesting. The first one was governments lead, private markets follow. And then the second one was the best markets to operate in are the, the best regulated. Um, so I think that as impactful as Microsoft is, and we all know that it is, and the fact that Microsoft is also part of um, a sort of growing movement towards stakeholder capitalism, 
Uh, I think that um, when somebody as impactful as the president of Microsoft is calling on government to provide that leadership and to provide structure and regulation for companies like Microsoft to operate within, uh, I think that this is a, a very clear signal that this is, you know, that we can expect some changes around the, the ways in which um, capitalism operates. And then he moved on to talk about something very interesting, which has to do with privacy laws, right? So the privacy laws in Northern Europe are very different than the privacy laws are in the United States. And the privacy laws in Northern Europe are to, to protect individual citizens' privacies. Um, and so that is something that obviously these global technology companies have to contend with. And they, there have been some pretty big lawsuits um, in Northern Europe, which have been directed to the likes of Facebook, Google, Amazon. Um, and some of these indeed have been uh, privacy related, but also antitrust. But um, Volker, maybe you would like to talk. Um, well, let me pick you up it. on antitrust because it's very interesting. Uh, the European tradition was uh, cartelized in the interwar period. You built cartels and alliances between independent companies that fixed prices and production quotas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the Americans came in because the Sherman Act of 1890 had actually um, pushed American capitalism into an oligopolistic capitalism, not monopolies and trusts, but rather uh, a sort of more decentralized capitalism, which also left enough space for the little ones, the corner shops, etc., even though they were always under pressure. But if you look at um, cities in this country, it's always amazing how many little guys uh, and mom and pop shops do survive against the big trusts. And after 1945, the Americans insisted and destroyed the European cartel tradition. No more cozy, anti-competitive relationships between firms. And the irony is that this is now boomeranging back from Europe because they all have antitrust rules themselves in the EU uh, into this country because it's always also about enforcement. If you have a rule-based capitalism, you also have to be prepared to enforce the rules. And if that will is lacking, as it was under the pre previous administration, you get these huge conglomerates, of course, who begin to dominate the market and all of a sudden you have monopolies again, like uh, Amazon. And that is why I think this transatlantic relationship from purely legal rule-based perspective is also interesting because it is an interaction. And I think the Europeans are nudging uh, the Justice Department in Washington now a bit and say, well, you know, you have the Sherman Act, you can intervene against Bezos and Google, but you have to be prepared to do this and you've got to go to the courts and, and sue them. And that is, of course, what the Europeans have done with Google, Google and also uh, Gates and so on. So I think uh, there are these, if on a purely economic legal level, these interesting interactions that, again, uh, will have consequences, I hope, at least in the future. Very good. Um, okay, so maybe one more question. Uh, what is your view of the end game? Do we end up in market controlled capitalism, hybrid government market controlled capitalism, or central government controlled socialism? What variables will force these outcomes? Well, it's well, a very good question. That's a very interesting let my Let me invoke something, if I may, which I hope will not kill the discussion. But we are both historians, and historians are always cowards when it comes to the future. I had a colleague who said, 
If uh, you want to do history, well, you look at the past and look at the implications of what happened in the past for the present. But if you want blueprints, please go to the engineering department and not <laughs> to the history department. But I don't want to kill off this very important question uh, because we are all, uh, you know, politically interested uh, scholars also, and therefore maybe you have a concluding remark on this uh, uh, ahistorical question. I think it can be historicized. So um, one of the um, one of the uh, the characterizations of the Johnson administration is that it was a form of social um, of uh, social engineering. So there's this idea that by using the state apparatus to um, to legislate um, sort of rules and regulations around how capitalism can function within American democracy, that was kind of like an engineering of um, of the terms and conditions under which um, capitalism might be able to operate. So there's that. Um, but then on top of that, you know, <clears throat> one of Ronald Reagan's, um, I think he wrote an essay about it, or it might have been the title of a speech, but it was something about encroaching control. So I think that um, that this, you know, experience back to the American experience of European totalitarianism. You know, like one of the impetuses behind union bashing has been uh, this um, sort of, you know, sort of issue with the idea of collectivism full stop. So it's not, you know, it's not um, only that unions represent a threat to corporations. It's also that the principle of collectivism is threatening to this, to American idealism um, and ideas around freedom and individuality and individual agency and the capacity of individuals to move from being, um, you know, left behind to self-made or this idea that you can, you know, start up a business and that it, it can become a unicorn. So, you know, does that paradigm function in a highly regulated environment? And I don't know, maybe that is a question for the future. But um, I think that these ideas of socially engineering the conditions under which capitalism operates within American democracy on the one hand, and then also this fear of being subsumed within a collective, which you don't have any individual agency to influence or control, um, is, you know, is, is um, deeply threatening to um, how many American presidents and policymakers have, um, you know, have hoped that America could, um, could realize uh, an American dream for everybody not through um, central, centralization and control, but by offering greater freedom and for people to accept that responsibility and the opportunity that comes with it. So it is a bit of a balancing act and I'm not sure anybody has really gotten it right yet, but we'll see what the Biden administration holds for us. Well, and I would like perhaps as a concluding remark, you know, we are always both. We are individuals who want to have free speech and you know develop ourselves but we are also social beings not just within the family context or our local community but we have also a larger horizon i think uh, that uh, unites people and not just within a nation state but even beyond that and it is as you rightly say a balancing act because we are a bit schizophrenic all the time. Uh, and uh, on the one hand, you know, sometimes we are more social and feel that uh, we should uh, consider our neighbors also who are uh, be below the poverty line. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, of course, we also want to make our own decisions and uh, not just with regard to our families, but more largely. So that's the big tension that we still have to face. And uh, uh, that has been a tension that existed 
in European and also American society from the very beginning. Well, I very much enjoyed this. Uh, Colleen, thank you very much for sort of joining me in this discussion. Uh, I now see that people are sort of dropping out and maybe we have indeed reached the point where we have hopefully sort of uh, left a few ideas uh, that people would like to continue to pursue. Of course, ultimately uh, we were, and you expect this of Columbia University products, not very conservative in the way we, uh, we talked about the world and the past, but uh, nevertheless, I hope it was also sufficiently rational and comprehensible what we tried to do. I certainly felt that you were very lucid in what you were trying to explain to everybody. So there are still now 90 people or so uh, who are listening to us and I would like to uh, thank them and uh, say, well, uh, I hope if you have an email that you want to send us, uh, to ask further questions. We'll be very happy to use the Columbia DC network to continue this conversation. And I'm sure you would share this view. Yes, indeed. Likewise, Volker, it was a real pleasure being able to, um, to and, and honor, frankly, to be able to co-present on this topic with you. And I also would like to thank the audience um, for being so engaged. We still have loads of questions left um, to go through. And I do hope as well that um, some of the people who have asked these questions will reach out to us with them um, so we can answer them more th thoroughly also um, through email. Thank you very much to Candice for organizing and for the, um, you know, all of the preparation and groundwork um, that he's put into this great event. And I thoroughly enjoyed myself. Thank you so much to the Columbia Alumni Association for hosting. And it was such a great pleasure and such a great honor to be able to speak to you this evening. Bye. <laughs>